In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. It's good to have you with us wherever you are joining us from. And let us start with our first hymn. Gather together as God's family, let us ask forgiveness from our Heavenly Father, for he is full of gentleness and compassion. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing the glory.
So let us pray. O Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfil them, through Jesus Christ your Son our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. A reading from St Paul's second letter to Timothy. Continuing what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for his people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not, grant, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? He will delay long in helping them. I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them, and yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of the Lord.
if ever there was a heartfelt prayer, then I think the one that we often hear from the apostles that talks about increase our faith would be very high on that list. As a priest, I so often hear people say that their faith is weak, that they are riddled with doubts. Even in the sacrament of reconciliation, people come in and confess that they lack faith. Yet, the lack of faith is not, nor ever could be a sin. Let me expand on that. Denial of faith certainly is a sin if it's the result of a deliberate, systematic process of doubting. If you are someone who had the faith, but then as a result of a deliberate decision, clearly rejected it and denied God, then it would be a sin. But I don't think this applies to very many people. And it's certainly not what I'm talking about. I'm also not talking about any negligence in relation to one's faith, which begins with neglecting prayer and church attendance and leads to deliberately forgetting about God, ultimately lapsing into a sinful way of life. There are, however, very many people who are assailed with doubts and anxieties about their faith. Doubts come to them in a similar way to distractions in prayer. They are going along quite nicely, but then they are suddenly beset with worries and find themselves asking questions like, what if none of this is true? Maybe God doesn't exist. Is the church just one elaborate confidence trick to keep the masses quiet? If God really does love us, why do terrible things happen? Will I go to hell because I don't fully believe in him? Worrying about these doubts doesn't make those who experience them feel any better. In fact, it leads to more uncertainty. And neither are they the result of a deliberate decision to doubt their faith because these thoughts come unwanted. A person frequently tries to search for their faith and the certainties of their childhood, and then they despair because they can't find them. It can be real torture for them. First of all, it's important to say that the faith of the child is not appropriate for an adult. The child needs certainties and usually finds these in the reassurance of a parent or another authority figure. But the parent has to simplify things for the child and knows that the child grows, it will in due time come to an understanding of the greater complexities of life. And it is the same with our faith. As children, we take it for granted, but as we grow and mature into adulthood, we see more and more complexities, and our faith needs to become more sophisticated as a result. We begin to see that life as a follower of Jesus is all about choices, and that sometimes is very hard to discern the right choice. We tend to see faith as given and static, and this often blocks the development of our faith. There is a real difference between the person who has doubts and those who deliberately reject their faith or through neglect fall away from the practice of their faith and end up having completely excluded God from their life. And the difference is the doubts come unbidden, unwanted. One of the things that the online service does is it very much enables people to keep connected with their faith. And I know some of you are local to me and some of you aren't. But it's very much a case that you can keep connected to your faith and hear scripture, hear the word of God, and we offer prayers and worship God, meeting God in word and in sacrament. Some people want to believe and find themselves doubting, and they feel that God is far away from them. It is as if the anchor that they held on to earlier in their life has now become loose. Clearly, this is no deliberate choice. 
This is quietly not a rejection of God, but an anxiety state. It's difficult to deal with because the person generally feels that God is far away. I think that this is a condition that most dedicated followers of Christ will go through at some time or another. Certainly some of the great saints have experienced and described. <coughs> it is as if God removes himself for a time and we feel bereft and without hope. And it can be experienced as a time of testing or loss. The thing to hang on to is that these feelings and doubts are unwanted. We want to believe, but we find ourselves full of uncertainties. And if we can keep that desire to believe at the front of our minds, it will help us through these difficulties. Faith is not something static. It is not something that once achieved remains the same forever. This is because we believe in a person, God, and since all relationships are essentially dynamic, so is our relationship with God. We experience this in marriage and other relationships in our lives. There is always some movement and change. Our relationship with God is no different. Over time, we experience adjustment and change. Sometimes God seems extraordinarily close and other times further away. We use the terms near and far, but what we're talking about is not that it is God who is near or far, but how we experience God. God is everywhere. And indeed, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. But God exists in an entirely different order from us. The saints describe periods of difficulty as being extraordinarily fruitful. However, we only see the fruits in retrospect and at the time only experience the difficulty. Our trust in God is tested severely and we sometimes find ourselves on the verge of losing all hope. At these times, we should remember that we are not alone. We are not a group of isolated followers of Jesus, but a community of faith. And if at certain times our faith is very weak, and the faith of the whole community of believers can sustain us. We can think of ourselves as being carried along by the faith of the others. We are helped and supported spiritually, but other members of people are around, of course, and there are people in our lives to talk to about particular aspects of faith that we might be finding difficult. Christ sometimes talks about our faith, even when apparently strong, is really quite weak indeed. We, um, when we go through life, we have to remember, we consider the love that God has for us. We appreciate the blessings that God has already poured on us and the many more that God has in store for us then we begin to realise that even the faith we once thought was strong means practically nothing to him. God loves us with faith or without, and our perceptions of God's nearness or far awayness really don't count for much at all. All our anxieties is if nothing compared to God's anxiety, and we should appreciate God's love for us. Let us declare our faith in God, as we say together, We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word, we feel your memory alive and active within us. We know you hear our emotions and thoughts, hear the prayers that we bring before you. Encourage us and let our faith exploration continue to guide us, as that is a sign of God's presence continually working within us. Lord, in your mercy, With the looming threat of recession, we pray for all those who are struggling to make ends meet. May they find the support they need to survive and hope for better days ahead to thrive. Lord, in your mercy.
with blood supplies falling to critically low level in England. We pray for all those experiencing cancelled operations. We give thanks to the kind-hearted actions of those who donate their blood, portraying a powerful expression of human solidarity and Christian charity. Lord, in your mercy. As scientists predict an autumn wave of COVID, and with cases rising since September, we pray that communities stay healthy and look after those that are isolated and most vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick, for Margaret, Joseph, Harry, Baby Lee, Helena, Pauline, Phil, Robert, Bill, Rachel, Mark, Dominic, Anne, Sylvia, Glynis, Melanie, Marco, and Baby George and Baby Noah. Bring healing to all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Particularly for the families of Trevor, Ray, Chris, Wendy, Liz, Sherry, David and Brenda. May they be greeted by a chorus of angels as they journey to their forever home, seated safely beside our heavenly King. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, help us to persevere with dedicated prayer life. Thank you for always loving and guiding us. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. We meet in the name of Christ and share his peace. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us sing our next hymn. <laughs> thanks unto the Lord our God. Thank you Father for making us in our wonderful world. Wherever we are in your world we should always thank you through Jesus your Son. And so with the angels and everyone in heaven together we sing. Great and wonderful Father, we remember when Jesus had supper with his friends the night before he died. He took bread. 
He thanked you, broke it, gave it to his friends and said, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you, gave it to his friends and said, all of you drink from this cup because this is my blood, the new promise of God's love. Do this every time you drink it to remember me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So, loving Father, remembering how dearly Jesus loves us, we should love him too. Send your Holy Spirit, gentle as a dove, on us and on these gifts, so that everyone who eats and drinks this bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus, we may be full of your life and goodness. Help us all to walk hand in hand with Jesus and live our lives for him. All honour and glory belong to you, Father, through Jesus your Son, with the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. This is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. <laughs> So let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love is the fulfilling of the law. Grant that we may love you with our whole heart and our neighbours as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing our next hymn.
It's been good to join with you today and uh, I look forward to you being with me next week. Uh, tonight we have uh, our service at Rescola, our Celtic service, which will have a healing and wholeness uh, theme. Just to remind you that if you're local or you know anyone that's local, Christmas Day, uh, Christmas Day dinner will be done again uh, at Trevor Irving Community Hall. You need to book in with that, but there is no cost, uh, so that would be good. Um, and I hope you stay safe. So the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.